So now I will move from my, uh, this presentation of the French, uh, uh, the French way to at the university and the Grand Ecole. And I will show you some examples at the, the Louvre Museum. But first, thermoluminescence. Some of you are not familiar with thermoluminescence, so I will go a little bit, uh, first a little bit in detail about that. And the first observation of thermoluminescence comes from this guy, uh, Robert Boyd, uh, from Ir Ir Ireland. And he was a, a chemist, physicist, philosopher, and he did, at this time, the scientists uh, were doing a lot of different things. So this guy discovered first uh, uh, the emission coming from uh, uh, a piece of diamond, which <coughs> it was loaned by him. So there is a different story. One story is that he put his piece of diamond with him in the bed, and he realized when, when there's a, he was close to his body, the elevation of temperature uh, lead to a small luminescence. Then he moved to a, and what is he published? He, he moved to a flame of the candle, and he observed a luminescence coming out from this, uh, this piece of di diamond. So this is a book, you see, this is a book uh, when he, he put, uh, so this you can see the name here, uh, Robert Boyle, and uh, he described 12 observations presented uh, in 1663 on luminescence from a piece of diamond which are loaned to him to, to do this. So simultaneously, a little, oh, a little bit after, uh, this guy also was working at the uh, Royal Society in London, and he also tried to uh, make some complement information about the thermoluminescence and this effect. So, the thermoluminescence is a process of thermally stimulating the emission of light from a substance following the absorption of external energy by this, that substance. So in general, there is external energy source used to induce phosphorescence, it's called phosphorescence, or immediate afterglow. And there is, after the pre preliminary study, the first the, main, the development starts after the discovery of the radioactivity in the late 90, early 20th century. So I will, I will speak about delay fluorescence a little bit later. Two important persons for this, for the earliest observation of the optical stimulated luminescence, uh, Becquerel, Edmond, and Henri Becquerel. And they look at the infrared stimulated zinc sulfide and cadmium sulfide. And look at this uh, uh, spectrum also. Even, uh, I think, at the mid of the last century, you see they did some uh, OSL. It's a phosphorescence with infrared stimulation of this material. So it looks quite new and quite important to do, but it's already known a uh, long time ago, I guess. Uh, but illumination with infrared light, we can observe some luminescence coming from this uh, strontium uh, sulfate. Important word, the word luminescence and thermoluminescence was first defined by this uh, person, Wiedemann and Smith, uh, more than one century ago. They tried to explain the dissociation separation of charge and recombination to produce luminescence. At this time, they try to a little bit understand what's happened. What can have recombination after a long time? And they were already talking about separation of positive and negative charge. And that means a storage of charge. And then came the, the, the word phosphorescence from Becquerel, radio photostimulation, photostimulate phosphorescence, etc. And finally, optical stimulated luminescence by Fowler in 1963. So this is a few <coughs> historical of the uh, thermoluminescence and optically stimulated luminescence. So if you look at the publication of thermally stimulescence or thermoluminescence, you can clearly see that the first paper came out 
1914, but zero citation. The guy was uh, unlucky. <laughs> and then a lot of things appear. I put this, uh, this schedule because the effect of irradiation of solid was very important. And thermoluminescence was used for uh, irradiation dosimetry and archaeological datation. So very important uh, period with a lot of publication on this uh, field. And suddenly, it's decreased because of the age, probably of the age of the scientist also, and because there is a renew in the 90 with the discovery of uh, persistent luminescent material and new, uh, new thing I will tell you a little bit more after. So let's illustrate the thermoluminescence with uh, the well-known energy level diagram coming from the valence band and conduction band. So there is, this is a classical recombination from a valence band excitation and emission from the valence band. And when there is some traps, either electron traps or all traps, instead of having the recombination, you can have the storage of the electron or the hole in this trap. In that case, there is no more recombination because uh, one part of the <coughs> electron or hole is trapped. And you can induce the recombination by a release of the traps. In general, it's through the conduction band. And if you have heating, so this is the thermoluminescence. This means uh, you are heating. You can release the electron, for instance, for the trap. It's the same concerning the old traps. And according to the trap depth, there is one thermoluminescence peak for this depth. And when is a, the trap is a little bit deeper, for, for instance, in the case of the green traps, O2, there is a peak at the higher temperature. So you have a direct link between the temperature and the trap depth. And you have the same thing can occur with uh, old traps. So this is the basic of thermoluminescence, historical and a short presentation of the energy level, what they are presented here. And if you look at the fundamental of uh, persistent <coughs> luminescence, for instance, you have this kind of, uh, of schematic. And you see there is three kinds of traps. Deep traps, which are interesting for datation or dosimetry. There is what's so-called shallow traps and average traps in depth. And this one are used for persistent luminescence. And this is mainly related to the afterglow, shallow traps. And this is a recombination, a classical recombination. So, Of course, to measure this kind of phenomenon, you need a scientific apparatus. So what kind of apparatus? You need of one sample. First, an excitation coming from X-ray or UV irradiation, for instance. Then you need to eat the sample. You eat the sample either by uh, regular heating in a furnace, or you can have a release of traps by the lead or laser. So this can be in a CW, continuous wave, or a pulse or ramp mode. Then you have uh, thermoluminescence or optically stimulated luminescence coming out. Then you have to use a detector, PMT for instance, to measure the emission in the visible, and to use a filter in order to, to cut, uh, for instance, uh, one part of the light. So this is the classical way. So what does that look like? This looks like this, for instance, in the Louvre Museum. This is a, a OSL thermoluminescence uh, reader. So it is a RISO uh, DA20 automatic with uh, uh, excitation coming from uh, gamma ray, for instance, or beta irradiation. Uh, photomultiplier, so this is a detector. And you have the sample order and so on. So you put your sample inside and you can measure directly the light coming out after heating. In the lab, we have something to go at lower temperature. So this is a setup in the lab. We are excitation either with X-ray here 
or we use uh, directly UV radiation from this side. And this is uh, uh, the way to have low temperature and high temperature. In, here in uh, Kyoto University, the cryostar is not horizontal, but it's vertical, but it's the same, uh, exactly the same principle. Of course, you need uh, uh, optical fiber, for instance, or the detector coming out from uh, uh, optical fiber, uh, camera, and so on to detect, uh, the, to detect the photon coming out during the heating. So simple, quite simple exper experimental setup. But be behind this, I, I will not put a lot of uh, science in this uh, presentation, but there is a high level science coming out from the, uh, the traps recombination. So this is, for instance, what you can observe from the trap depth of uh, E in electron volts. And there is a frequency factor, S. And you have the thermoluminescence intensity coming out from this equation. So you have one trap, one central model, and you can have several central models when it's a several order model. So well-known Randall Wilkins first order glow peak look like this. It's an asymmetrical peak. Well, you can see the shape here. And uh, this is the expression a little bit more complicated, which can be solved in order to have uh, to extract the parameter. So the parameter seem quite simple when you look at this kind of uh, traps. You have the activation energy and the frequency factor and the number of trap electrons, for instance, or trap all. This is a symmetrical way. In fact, when you look in detail, for the more realistic model, you have to uh, look uh, a little bit more, and you, you need to add uh, different trapping probability, retrapping probability, and so on. So the model is a little bit more complicated, and in general, you have to test different models to know which is the best model. So if you look at the Adribos paper from Netherlands, you can see the guideline for the extraction of trapping parameter from the thermoluminescence glow curve. It explains that, uh, uh, of course, you need function of temperature, function of the dose, UV or X-ray dose, for instance. You have to control this. Function of the heating rate, very important, is to control and to move the heating rate in order to have the information about the mechanism. You can use a thermal cleaning. You stop, the, uh, you stop at one point and you, you wait for a while until it's completely uh, clean. And you have to apply different methods to double check. Inertial rise, et cetera, peak position. So this is uh, the tool that is uh, well known to extract the uh, parameter from thermoluminescence. 